Good evening. Thank you all for coming and uh, agreeing to sit here in a auditorium on one of the first really nice days, comparatively speaking, we've seen in a while. Uh, we have an exciting program for you today. Uh, as I was telling somebody just a few minutes ago, uh, my entire War College education was devoid of any talk of zombies. And so you are in for something none of us have seen before. So uh, I hope you'll find this exciting. It, we're going to look at not just zombies, but what's out there in the Pacific right now, the history of so many things, which is central to so much that we do here in the War College. The topic for today is sea power and the Pacific Ocean area. Not a simple issue, but if it were simple, it wouldn't be something that we work with and struggle with here at the War College, day in and day out. Like the other lectures that we've had previously, uh, we have time for a lecture and about 15 minutes for question and answer uh, upon completion of the lecture. Uh, so feel free to uh, share the information you, you've gotten here, uh, spread the word about uh, how good these lectures are. I haven't heard anybody say anything bad about them. Uh, but please keep in mind that the opinions being expressed uh, are those of the people expressing them and are not a reflection of the views of the War College, the US Navy, the Department of Defense. With that disclaimer out of the way, I'd like to introduce myself. I am Tony Fox. I'm a professor at the College of Maritime Operational Warfare. Uh, I work with Dave Pilati, who is usually the person who greets you for these things. He could not be here today because he has naval reserve duty at the Pentagon. Uh, so he asked me to try and fill his shoes. I'm lucky enough, however, to be able to introduce to you Professor Jim Holmes, who is one of the most published experts on the topic you're about to hear about here at the War College. Jim holds the J.C. Wiley Chair of Maritime Strategy here at the Naval War College and currently teaches in the Strategy and Policy Department and has previously taught in the National Security Affairs Department. So he's got a lot of experience across the college. He is the recipient of the 2016 Navy Meritorious Civilian Service Medal. He also has served in the Navy. That service includes service on the USS Wisconsin, a battleship during the first Gulf War. And during that war, Jim was gunnery officer and was the last officer in the US Navy to essentially pull the trigger on 16-inch battleship guns in anger. Jim holds degrees from Vanderbilt University, Salve Regina, Providence College, and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, where he earned his PhD in International Affairs. Jim has over 25 book chapters and 200 scholarly essays published. His most recent books, only his most recent books, are Strategy in the Second Nuclear Age and the recently published Red Star Over the Pacific, which has been named to the Navy professional reading list as essential reading. Copies have been placed on board every US Navy ship with every uh, Navy jet squadron or, or uh, aircraft squadron and shore installation. So for you Navy spouses who are here in the audience, when you go home from this lecture, you should be ready to quiz your, your spouses on the topics you're going to hear about tonight. We could go on with all of Jim's accomplishments, but I would like to close with one very pertinent fact. Our former Secretary of Defense, James Mattis, pronounced Professor Holmes to be troublesome. That is certainly an interesting compliment. Thank you very much for coming. And with that, Professor Holmes. Thanks, Tony, and thanks for everybody for coming out. 
Now, I bet, you, I bet you think that the title I gave the lecture is a cheap ploy to get you to come out on a nice uh, Tuesday afternoon. And you'd be right about that. But I think as I go along, you'll, you'll understand that there's actually a more serious point I'm trying to make in, uh, beneath the facetious invoking of zombies, even though everybody loves zombies. The Walking Dead, of course, has been a phenomenon for quite some time. Oh, let's see if we can get, ah, there we go. I think I got a little too cute with the animations here. And the, the point is this. The point is that when you, when you debate something as simple as the strength, the relative strength of the United States Navy vis-a-vis -vis its potential opponents, you're going to come across a lot of ideas that are, that are some of them are, of which are deeply flawed, most of them are partial, none of them is a single index of U.S. naval power vis-a-vis -vis its potential adversaries. So I want to equip you to ask the right questions as you, as you go out and as you, as you start hearing these partial fallacies about sea power to ask the right questions of the people who are putting them about, because you will hear this from very distinguished people. And we, did, we definitely need to hold people's uh, feet to the fire as we go forward. So that's, a, so that's really the idea behind uh, the facetious title that I gave it. As I said, you, you will, when you do this, I've been, I've been writing about this stuff for at least 10 years, and I, the ideas, they keep coming back. We're not talking about real ghouls, we're talking about undead ideas that refuse to die about sea power. You will often tell you, you will oftentimes feel like you're, you're Rick Grimes, you're standing behind a thin fence, and as you know, shooting down a zombie, you can take it out, you can take it out with a headshot, and 10 more just like it come behind it, and you have to take those down, and that's, that's just the kind of relentless uh, parade, a parade of ideas that, uh, that you will sometimes encounter when debating about sea power. Now, if you, if you, want to, if you prefer to read this, just, uh, just yesterday, Yahoo picked up a, co a column that I ran on Sunday about this, basically making the same points that I'm about to make to, to, to you right now in capsule form, including using the zombie analogy, which is always one that gets a lot of readership. Now, let me, let me uh, tell you what my agenda is for our time together this afternoon. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about U.S. maritime strategy, review that for you. So that, we, so that we see what we are trying to accomplish in the Pacific theater, the Indo-Pacific region, as we've taken to calling it in recent years. Then I want to turn and talk about resources. Talk about the, talk about the resources that the, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the, and the Coast Guard, the American Sea Services, have allocated, uh, have allocated to that region in order to execute our strategy. And then finally, I want to spend, I want to spend about the last uh, half of our time or thereabouts talking about why it is so hard for ourselves even if, even if we are stronger on the whole than our adversaries, to make ourselves strong in the Western Pacific and in the Indian Ocean region. It is just not easy to go on to somebody else's home court, just as in sports, it's the same, same way in naval warfare. It's, it's just hard, even if you're the stronger team, to be the visiting team and go defeat a home team on its own home court. So let me turn right to it. Our strategy goes by this, and this dates back to about the 2011-2012 timeframe under the Obama administration. When the, the sea services and then the administration picked up on it as well, declared that we would pivot to Asia. As you know, the United States, as an offshoot of the British Empire, has traditionally looked more across the Atlantic and thought more about Europe, the Mediterranean Sea, the North Atlantic, and so forth, than about the Pacific Ocean region. So, in a sense, this was a, this was a change up in, in America's strategic orientation. Uh, prompted by the rise of uh, China, the rise of the rise of Russia as well, and its uh, move to reestablish itself in the Far East and so forth. This uh, this was a shift in priorities, and that warranted that warranted uh, uh, a move a move of resources in terms of ships and airplanes and all the things that make up sea services. These are the two these are the two uh, documents that uh, that codified that uh, the pivot to Asia for the sea services back in 2007 over in our other auditorium Spruance Auditorium you see the doc we, we saw the document on the, your left the merit the cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power unveiled on the stage there it was updated or was as the navy said refreshed in 2015 but i think the essentials more or less stayed the same here's what the uh, Here's what, the, here's what the 2007 version said that the, the sea services should try to accomplish in the Indo-Pacific region. First of all, uh, we would, that we would, uh, we would keep credible combat power on station in that region for the foreseeable future, for the next 10 to 15 years, whatever the shelf life of the document happened to be. This was widely interpreted, including by myself, as, as meaning that the United States meant to stay number one in those regions as far as, as, far as uh, naval power and the support, supporting air power and, uh, uh, and, the, and all the joint services that are in that region. So again, we set out a pretty ambitious aim as, starting to, as trying to stay number one in somebody else's backyard. Secondly, and to, and to put a little more oomph into that, this, this, the document declared that we would reserve the right unto Washington 
to take local sea control of any expanse of water within that uh, larger region. And in fact, if you read the document uh, uh, pretty broadly, it seems to say we, could, we would do that across the globe if we saw it fit to do so. We would prefer to do it with our allies, but we reserve the right to do it on our own if, if necessary. This is a very, very ambitious thing to say, and yet it was, it was codified in that document. And lastly, and this, this was a little bit of a departure from past maritime strategies, which were more or less about sinking the Soviet Navy or sinking whoever, whoever our adversary of the time happened to be. These, document, these documents stated that the United States would like to as assemble coalitions and partnerships and alliances to be a multinational custodian of the system of maritime trade and commerce and also of military affairs. That's why you hear so much about freedom of navigation for, uh, or as I prefer, freedom of the sea, which, which basically is the idea that seagoing sea -going nations may use the sea as a highway to do, conduct maritime affairs, whether it is commercial affairs, military affairs. The, the, if you read the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the, which is referred to as the Constitution of the Oceans, it reserves almost complete freedom outside certain, outside certain uh, distances from coastal states to actually do commercial and military things. We, thought that we, we actually thought that this uh, was an idea that was uh, more or less unchallenged until the rise of China. And, it, and what it's trying to do in the Chinese, China seas have called that into question, and also Russia and the Black Sea to a lesser extent as well. So again, very, very ambitious document, and there, if you were tried to execute it, it's also going to be very resource intensive as well. Uh, the Obama administration, in its last, in its last uh, year or so in office, also codified its own ideas about the Asia Pacific, and it basically just said what I did. I, I actually, I was, I stood up and cheered when I saw page one of this document back in 2015. And it starts off by talking about why we and our allies and partners and friends should all try to defend freedom of the sea. Because if you need access, if you need access to the rimlands of East Asia or Western Europe, whatever the case may be, you have to be able to get there. And most things, whether it's commerce, military power, still go by, still go by water, even if this, uh, even in this age of air and space power. So it does, uh, freedom of the seas actually does need a guardian, especially, especially when uh, great powers are increasingly challenging that. Now, I, I alluded to the 60-40 split. This is, when you translate this into resource terms, uh, the, the, the sea services basically said, look, we are going to reallocate some of our resources so that about 60% uh, of, the, of the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard assets would be in the Indo-Pacific region. This, of course, is a picture of USS Ronald Reagan, which is, uh, which is the core of a, of a carrier strike group based in Yokosuka, Japan, which is where, which is where it is pictured right here. The, the idea was that, to, that we would swing out more forces so that the, we would have forces on scene should something go wrong between ourselves and China and Russia. But really, the question is, and that's, I mean, that's an input measure, isn't it? We're just basically saying, okay, we'll take 60% of our stuff and our 60% of our manpower and put it in the region. But the real question is, is that enough to win? If you think about it, if we want peace in the Indo-Pacific region, we need to not only be able to win, whether it's having a good strategy, a good operations, and, and, and so forth, and then the resources to execute them, but also to impress upon our opponents that we will win. If we can make believers out of them, they probably are not going to challenge us, they, and, and thus freedom of the sea and all of our other interests in the region may, may survive without a fight. So really, you really do have to ask yourself whether 60% is enough. I will, I'm not going to say it, but I will at least, I will at least imply that I, I, I'm not entirely convinced that 60% of, of our forces are enough. But this is, this is something that you, can, that you can debate with yourselves and we can talk about during the uh, Q&A, if you like. And this, is where, and this is where these ideas, these undead ideas, start meddling with our calculations and throwing us off as we try to think clearly about these, ma these, the, about these matters. The first, uh, the first one of these uh, the fallacies about sea power, I would call the idea that he who spends the most wins. Think about it, think about it, especially in election years, a lot of times you're gonna hear people say stuff like this. This is out of the Washington Post, probably in about, I think this was during the 2016 election cycle. Usually it's gonna be phrased something like this. U.S. defense spending dwarfs most of the rest of the world. We spend more than the next X countries combined. That X is usually something like 12 or 13. In this case, they compare us with that. We spend almost as much as the next 14 countries combined, and therefore, we win. We simply, out, we simply outspend our adversaries, and therefore we will prevail. Well, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, spending is, uh, I mean, defense spending is obviously an important thing. We debate budgets every year. I mean, it, 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 it is something that is very, very important, obviously. But it is, is it decisive? 
Think about what the United States does in the world. We only play away games, as it's, as it's often said. And playing away games is a very, very expensive thing because it requires you to have bases on the, route, on the routes to places that you might fight, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in uh, uh, the Philippine Islands, where, whatever the case may be. This, these are things that cost a lot of money that our adversaries who are fighting close to home do not have to spend because they're within easy reach of their own home bases. We also have a lot of expensive stuff on our, on our, in our inventory. This is, uh, this is our uh, latest uh, guided missile destroyer, which is really a cruiser, I would say. Uh, USS Zumwalt sitting at Pier 2 a couple of years ago when they, when they stopped here in Newport uh, en route from Bath to the, to the West Coast. This is, a, this is a guided missile destroyer that costs $4 billion. That's a, I mean, that's a, that, is something that, that is something that our adversaries really do not have in their inventories. That's, a, that's a something that's really going to start soaking up some of that differential in defense spending between ourselves, as indicated in that graphic. Here's the USS Ford. This is our next generation aircraft carrier, which has undergone some growing pains. But the important point that I would raise, raise with you here is that this is a $13 billion asset. And that's just the haul. That's not, that, doesn't, that doesn't include uh, airplanes. That doesn't include crews stores or any of, any of the other things that goes into, into a, making a fighting ship a fighting ship. Again, a very expensive asset as well. It's gonna, I think it's gonna be a very good asset, but it does cost you. Speaking of airplanes, it, the, that, uh, that particular ship, as well as our older ships, will also carry uh, the, the new stealth fighters, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. These run, at, uh, I think the naval version is running about $106 million a copy. So plop a couple of squadrons of those on one of these uh, aircraft carriers, and you're, you're talking about adding two to three billion dollars. You, you get the idea. The, the, these uh, these uh, differentials, these simple cost, cost comparisons, budgetary comparisons, really do mask, uh, mask a whole lot. It's, it is simply more expensive to be the United States and wage war far, far, far from home. This is all happening at the, at the same time. We are also trying to recapitalize our fleet of undersea warfare, ballistic, ballistic missile submarines, which are dating from the Cold War and are getting really, really old. We're trying to, we're trying to build, uh, including these are, and these are being built uh, right here on the Narragansett Bay as well as over in Groton, Connecticut. These uh, ballistic missile submarines, the Columbia class, are running about $7 billion a copy, and we want 12 of them. This is a this is a shipbuilding program that uh, that uh, uh, CNO Richardson and his predecessors have said will bankrupt the Navy if it's not if it's not funded by extraordinary means all by itself it would squeeze out uh, spending on all of their shipbuilding programs so again something that needs to be done that is very very expensive manpower think think about this if anybody was a fan of the old Top Gear show which flamed out some years ago. They didn't, the, the Top Gear guys did not employ low cost labor to drive around their supercars and, and, do, and do silly things on, on screen. They, they employed very, very high cost labor, inclu including the Stig, this, uh, this uh, professional race car driver. Think about that as a metaphor for, for uh, American personnel costs. It's been estimated by the people in the China Maritime Studies Institute here at the college and, and, uh, and elsewhere that the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, can put about eight or nine sailors, soldiers, or airmen in uniform for every one American. It's, it's really, really expensive it's when, you, when you pay your people well, provide benefits, and so on and so forth. This, this, this is also something that's going to cut into, that, uh, into those budgetary disparities documented in that Washington Post graphic. So again, it's, it's, our people are expensive and our adversaries pay a lot less, and therefore, that's going to eat into, into the differentials as well. Bottom line, he who, spends the, the, he who spends the most need not win. It's, this is an important metric, but is a very po it's a very partial metric, and yet you see it oftentimes trotted out as if, as if it tells the entire story, which it does not. I think, let's move on to the next one. And you hear this a lot as well, including right here at the Naval War College, the idea that he who weighs the most wins. Kind of, a, kind of a funny one, isn't it? But yeah, here's, here's Robert Kaplan, one of the great uh, commentators on geopolitics, in my view, of all times. Standing in Spruance Auditorium a couple of years ago, says, uh, well, he's talking about the geography of the United States, but then he says the United States Navy is the largest in the world by far. What does he mean by that? If I, if I count up hulls, I mean, that's, a, that, that's, that's not only untrue, it's like a, absurdly untrue. In fact, uh, my, my friend uh, Captain Jim Fennell, former uh, U.S. Pacific Fleet uh, Intel chief, put out a nice uh, chapter in, in a China Maritime Studies uh, Institute book a couple of years ago, pointing out that by about 2030, 
China will, China's Navy will exceed 500 holes in the water at a time in which the United States Navy is trying to go to 355. So clearly, number, so clearly numbers do not explain what people are mean when they're talking about who has the largest Navy. Here's uh, Michael O'Hanlon of the Brookings Institution, another one of the great uh, defense commentators of, of our generation. He actually starts to get at what he's talking about. We are, we are trying to put more technology and spending and so forth into fewer hulls. But then he reverts back also and says, our gross tonnage, our aggregate tonnage of our fleet is about three times that of China. What he means basically is that our ships are bigger. And they, they actually have to be, don't they? If you're going to go across thousands of water, miles of water into the Western Pacific, 7,000, 8,000 miles of, of water, you have to have more fuel. You need to bring all your stuff, whether it's uh, spare parts, uh, stores, fuel, all this kind of stuff, in order to be able to fight, again, in somebody else's backyard. So he started to, he started to get at the point here. This, this, so there, again, this is, this is not an irrelevant point at all, but again, it only tells part of the story. So beware when you hear this, trot it out, as though size is the only thing that matters when you're comparing one fleet against another. I mean, think about it. If, they, if, you, if tonnage is the only determinant of combat power, of who has the strongest navy, well, this, this ship right here is five times as strong as, a, as the uh, Ford-class aircraft carrier I just showed you. This is the Emma Maersk, a commercial ship out of Denmark, which weigh, weighs in at about 550,000 tons, about five times the displacement of that aircraft carrier. Obviously an absurd, obviously an absurd comparison, but yet it illustrates uh, the, sort of the absurdity of just using tonnage as a proxy for combat power. Well, I mean, think about it. Do you think, do you think Coach Belichick before the, before the Super Bowl the other night was, was beating down this guy's, na this, this guy's door to be on the, on the defensive line? And yet, he's probably, he's probably bulks more than anybody on the Patriots lineup if he actually came into, came into camp. Love the zit on his, on his uh, belly there, too. It's kind of fun. This way, this, now this, way, this, this, this uh, image to me gets, it starts, getting, it starts getting at what, a more realistic way of measuring naval power. If this, if this is a proxy, if this is an image of US naval power, I, then I'm kind of happy because this is a big, beefy guy who ha also has a lot of combat power. If we can take the PLA Navy and sling it around like this and give it a nice wedgie, I'm good with that. This, uh, this, seems, like, this seems like a really, really good metaphor for US naval power. And I hope that we approximate this the more than we do that Patriots fan. He who weighs the most need not win in battle. Now the next, one, the next uh, fallacy that I would call to your attention is sort of the idea that at some point in the past, the United States Navy was the right size, had the right number of ships, the right amount of combat capability, and so on and so forth. And therefore, if we fall below that, if we fall below that number of ships or whatever, then we're in dire peril. This is, a, this is another one that comes up a lot in election years. We didn't hear too much about it this past year just because it was mostly just congressional elections, but especially in presidential election years, this comes up a lot. The idea that the Navy is in dire peril because it is the smallest since 1917. 1917, I'm not sure why, exactly why they picked 1917 in particular. 1916 is the year the, the, the Wilson administration launched us onto a major naval expansion. To me, that would be the logical year. But, I, but anyway, that's the, that's the idea. This is when the United States Navy starts to become a two ocean Navy, such as we're used to today. So the idea is that we now have fewer ships than we did in 1917, and therefore we are in a danger zone. You've actually heard this actually kind of recently, uh, just, just in, uh, in the wake of the 2018 elections, we've actually seen a change in the Senate Armed Services Committee with Senator David Perdue taking over the Sea Power Subcommittee. And he actually, he actually used that, uh, that little factoid. We have the smallest Navy since World War I. Again, as though this is some sort of threshold beneath which we should really be alarmed about the size of the Navy. This is, uh, this is something, like I said, this is something that comes up. It's a, per, it's a hardy perennial. This is, what, this is our former uh, Navy Secretary, uh, Ray Mavis, a few years ago. And he's actually re he's rebutting this idea. And I think he actually rebuts one fallacy with another one. Let me, let me show you what he says here. He says, well, I mean, this is, a, this is a pointless comparison because ships today are far more advanced and more capable than their predecessors from a century ago. Which is, which, which is undoubtedly true. I, I'm pretty sure the Great White Fleet, if, we, if it steamed into a Norfolk, would not stand up to today's fleet very well. That's what he says. Man, it's a, the fleet is not, it's not, it's not nearly technically advanced back then as it is now. But, I, but they, the, the part that it t tends to get left out when you hear that sort of riposte, that sort of comeback against the idea 
that the Navy is in trouble because it's, uh, it's, it's smaller than 1917. It's, they never seem to mention that, yes, ships have moved on, but also the threat environment has moved on as well. Think about, do you think the, uh, do you think the Great White Fleet, the fleet of 1917, faced Chinese stealth fighters? Probably not. I mean, when you think about what combat is, you're talking about relative combat power. If the Navy, if the Navy today is strong enough relative to the threat, then it is sufficient. Going back, going back a century and, and, st and stacking these things up is really not all that meaningful a comparison. And yet, it happens a lot. Ships today are far more advanced, but also are the, so also are the threats that they face. So I'll always be prepared to ask the questions when you hear these simple metrics tossed off as though they, t they tell us everything that we need to know about the naval balance. Next, the, uh, and this, one, this one's uh, pretty commonplace as well, the idea basically that if I want to figure out who has the stronger force I basically flip open uh, your jeans, fighting ships, or whatever your favorite uh, reference book is about naval power. Look at and see who has the most ships, airplanes, and, uh, and, and weapons, and so forth. And that, then that you can basically pit one fleet against another and figure out who is going to win. And that one, that one seems to make uh, superficial sense, doesn't it? To me, that, to me the, the, the idea conjures up, the, this is a, an image out of the Battle of Jutland a little over a century ago. And it was, I mean, this was a very much a naval battle. The Imperial German, German Navy met, met, the, uh, met the Royal Navy's Grand Fleet out in, the, out in the North Sea, far away from land, and they had a fight. It was solely a naval on naval encounter. Nothing else, could re nothing else coming from shore could really influence the outcome. And that's, uh, I mean, that's something that was, I think that was fairly commonplace back during the age of sail and really, uh, really up until about 1916. But yeah, but, but think about it. Think about, the, think about the range of implements that are, that are available to, to uh, coastal powers these days. I'll show a couple of them to you. Sea battle, involved, sea battle today is a, is a matter for more than fleets and more than navies as well. There is a range of implements that can actually shape events out at sea. If I'm going to fight in the China Seas, the East China Sea, Yellow Sea, South China Sea, whatever the case may be, I will be fighting within, within reach of an array of Chinese land-based aircraft packed with, packed with anti-ship missiles. These are things that can come out and supplement the, the fighting power of the PLA Navy. That has to be counted into uh, two calculations of Chinese sea power. It's a, and it actually gets even more, even more uh, uh, troublesome than that. So China has, declared, has uh, evidently developed the world's first working anti-ship ballistic missiles. These are ballistic missiles that can strike from sites on the Chinese mainland against moving ships hundreds if not thousands of miles away. If, so if I get within those hundreds or thousands of miles of Chinese, of, of, of Chinese coastline, then I might be standing into danger. This, uh, this is the original one, the DF-21D, which reportedly has a range of about 900 to perhaps, to perhaps out as far as 1,500 nautical miles, which would mean once you get, to, once you get shoreward of Guam, you might be in weapons reach of this thing. Back in 2015, at a military parade in Beijing, uh, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, also paraded the DF-26, an extended range uh, ballistic missile, reportedly able to strike as far, as, uh, as far offshore as potentially 2,500 miles. You're starting to talk about getting west of Wake Island being within missile reach of the Chinese coastline. Again, these are, these are implements that you would have to, have to add to the total aggregate power of the, of the PLA to resist an American offensive. It would be very to becoming increasingly difficult just to get into the theater. Here's a, here's a graphic that, uh, and this is not a partisan thing. This is, I think this is out of one of the Trump administration's reports on uh, Chinese military power. But you will find a version in the Obama administration's, the Bush administration before that. They are, you, will, you will generally find a map of China depicting the ranges of various, the, depicting the various ranges of uh, aircraft and missiles reaching offshore. And as, you can, as you can see, let me, let me grab my laser and I'll, show, and I'll point it out to you a little bit. If you look at the if you look at those uh, the range rings ri rippling out, well, there's Taiwan. You can tell Taiwan Taiwan is within a range of a whole lot of stuff, as is Japan. On a, on out to the second island chain centered on Guam, straight to Malacca is within, is within reach of certain weapon systems without even those weapons even leaving uh, even leaving the Chinese mainland. So again. This are, these, these are danger zones around China. Around China. These are not hard shells that, that basically delineate a no-go zone, but it does show that you're standing into danger if you go in within those reaches. What can you find there? The PLA Navy has, uh, 
has fielded an assortment of uh, small craft that, that can also operate within those general envelopes as well, whether it's diesel submarines packed with anti-ship missiles, whether it's these 230-ton uh, small craft, these, these, these small Hobay catamarans that are also packed with anti-ship missiles. These, are, these two can lend their firepower to the defensive effort for the PLA, facing off against the United States coming from, coming from the Eastern Pacific. I like this kind of, uh, I like this garish graphic simply because the color coding indicates that as you start closing in the, on the Asian mainland, the defenses get deeper and deeper and denser and denser, and thus moving from the yellow light into the red zone. So these are, these, these are, these are zones in which we could expect to incur a, a potentially heavy cost just to get to the battle theater. And I'm just leave, just just to uh, point out a couple of things that you hear about a lot about in the news. These are, this is one of the uh, manufactured islands in the South China Sea. These are things that are not, that have now been completed and armed, also with guns and missiles and so forth, to lend that sort of firepower farther offshore as you as you penetrate deeper into the South China Sea. You can also I used to this used to be a laugh line a few years ago. You can actually look you can actually look at almost anything that can go to sea as part of Chinese sea power. If you look at the confrontations in the South China Sea, this has actually been the vanguard of, these have actually been the vanguard of the Chinese, uh, uh, what we call the gray zone strategy. Fish, a large fishing fleet manned by maritime militiamen. These, are, these, are, these have been the shock troops, essentially, for, the, for, for uh, Beijing as it faces off against the Vietnamese Coast Guard, the Philippine Coast Guard, and so forth. So again, these are implements that China can use to shape events at sea. You have to factor that in as well. Don't think they would go up against a destroyer, but they can do a lot in that sort of uneasy, in that sort of uneasy piece in which we find ourselves. So bottom line, when you think about this, when you start aggregating who has the stronger fleet, it's not, it's not who has the stronger fleet, it is who feels the stronger force is likely to win. So don't, don't, don't ever get sucked into thinking this is solely a Navy on Navy thing that we are talking about. And in fact, when you, when you start, to, when you start to, uh, uh, to think about putting all these metrics in and trying to come up with a realistic picture, there's a, a lovely anecdote in, uh, uh, in this history of the Vietnam War, which we used when I was a student here. The idea is basically the Nixon administration comes in in 1969 and wants to know when we are going to win the Vietnam War. So they feed all the statistics into the computer, and the computer says, you won in 1964. It is very, it's really, it's really, really very uh, difficult to, to come up with a realistic estimate about combat power just by using partial statistics, which is uh, what the idea of this joke is trying to convey. Garbage in, garbage out. So always, so, so always, demand, always demand more, more metrics so that you can come up with some sort of realistic uh, uh, appraisal of what the combat balance is at a certain place on the map at a certain time, give a, given a certain adversary. You simply, have to, you simply have to be more sophisticated than these simple metrics would suggest. Now, if you sum up these uh, bad ideas or these, these partial ideas, you get things like this from very distinguished commentators. I'm going to pick on John Mearsheimer. He's a professor of political science out at uh, uh, the University of Chicago and has been a commentator on maritime strategy since the 1980s. In fact, he was here in the mid-'80s uh, to comment on the U.S. maritime strategy against the Soviet Union. He was just here a few weeks ago also to, to, in a follow-up vis-a-vis China. And here's what he, uh, he, he, he doesn't actually say this, but I'm, I'm gonna show you something. This is actually act accurately conveys what he's trying to say. Here's what he says in his, uh, oh, excuse me, here's what he says in his, in his influential book, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. Here's how he leads it off. Present day China does not possess significant military power. Wow, that's a, I've just showed you an array of things that seem to contradict him. And, and let's look at the second half of the sentence. Its military forces are inferior to those of the United States. And he seems to think that the second half of the sentence supports the first half. Isn't it possible that, uh, that China's military forces could be inferior to those of the United States on the whole, but yet str stronger at the right place and time where China sees the need to do battle? And I will suggest to you that the answer is quite clearly yes. In fact, uh, political scientists who study this kind of thing have uh, done surveys of history and concluded that the weaker power wins about a third of the time scoping back through history because uh, it concentrates at the right place and time. It, it's smart, it does things smarter. It wants its goals more. There's a, there's, a whole, there's a whole array of factors that can offset simple calculations of military strength like we've been going through. 
but yeah, he, and so he goes on and he, he, he draws out rather strong implications from this. China is weaker on the whole than the United States and therefore it is a major, major disaster for China if it picks a fight with the United States these days. Really. All right, and obviously I'm going to argue with that and say and take issue with that. And, and we'll spend the balance of our time talking about why this is such a, a misguided way of looking at military power and naval power. Away games are hard, as I started off by saying. Here's our, here's our patron saint in the strategy and policy department. Sorry for those of you who are current students, but uh, you, I mean, you, just can't have, you just can't have a talk without the, with the, without the grand master Karl von Clausewitz. He's basically saying a really, really simple thing here. He's basically saying, one, be really strong. Go to Gold's Gym, you know, hang out every day, bulk up, so that you are really, really strong in general. But then he goes on and, they start, and then he starts to break this down. Yes, it's important to be strong in general. It'd be best to have the biggest and strongest military, but it's the most important to be strong at the decisive point, at the decisive time. That's where the fight is gonna happen. If it, it doesn't really matter how much uh, stuff you got, your, uh, your adversary has. If it's far away, it really matters what's, what's on the scene at the right time and place for battle. And therefore, he's, this is one of the passages he's known for, keeping concentrated, keeping all your stuff, all your manpower, resources, and stuff at that decisive place is the best way to, sh to assure that you outmatch your opponent. Pretty, pretty straightforward, isn't it? Wherever the battle is, you want to be stronger there, and therefore it's best to concentrate most of your stuff at that point. And here he actually, and here he actually gets, a, get to, gets at it a little more deeply and a little more, and a little more accurately. Keep in mind that we are talking about relative superiority at a, particular, at a particular place in time. Even if you are not stronger than your adversary on the whole, you can still be stronger at the right place in the right time. I mean, think, take, a, take, a simple, take a simple metaphor. Uh, what are there, probably 100 of you all here? I, I, I sort of doubt that I have more aggregate combat power myself, even though I work out and so on and so forth against all 100 of you. But if you all were to scatter all the way throughout the War College com compound, and if I, could, if I could arrange a series of one-on-one -on -one battles against you all, I might stand a chance. That's what Clausewitz's idea is. If I, if I can outmatch you at the decisive place in time, I might actually be able to beat you, even though collectively you all are far stronger than I am. A very basic idea he's, he's trying to make, but it's actually, a, it's actually a really powerful point as well. And that's something we, we need to bear in mind as we think about military power in the Pacific and elsewhere in the world. You need to be relatively deci decisive at that, at that place. Here's the, uh, here's the Pacific Ocean. Here's the, th here's the theater that we are finally coming to that brings us together today. You notice it's a pretty watery place, if you, courtesy of Google Maps here. North America to the extreme right, Asia to the extreme left. Not a whole lot in the middle except, uh, except uh, the Hawaiian archipelago and lots of small islands and atolls in the middle of the ocean. Which is all right because we know zombies can go underwater. So, they, so, the, so this logic applies to what we're talking about as we start to come to the particular scene in time. Let's look at some maps as we start to, to get some sense. When you're thinking about strategy, always th start with geography. This is a map out of the, this is a World War II era map out of the, the World, Fortune Atlas of World Strategy published in 1943. Makes a really, makes a really salient point. You're talking about a large theater. In fact, I delineated in red, this is the, this is the outer defense perimeter that Imperial Japan sought to make the edges, of, to, to make the maximum of extent of the Japanese empire. It basically wanted to partition off these waters for its own and, and leave, the, leave the rest basically to the United States. That's a vast amount of water space that, that Japan was trying to defend with actually a pretty lean sized fleet. And that's a big theater, but there are bigger theaters, aren't there? Look, at that, look down from the pole. This is a, Nicholas Spikeman's, uh, a map out of Nicholas Spikeman's book, Geography of the Peace, published the same year as that one. In red, I've, I've, drawn out the, I've drawn out those waters again. These are the waters that mostly concern China the way they mostly concern Japan 75 years ago. That's where, the, that's, where, that's where China can afford to concentrate its assets. Do that Clausewitzian thing, try to be stronger within those waters. Where do, you think the, where do you think the major theater for the United States is? Even in the age of the pivot, the United States has a really, really hard time cutting loose commitments. We have commitments all over the globe. Yes, 60% in the, in the Pacific and so forth, 
But if you, if you look at Russia making mischief, we've, we've had exercises off, uh, off of Norway just in the last few months. There's, we just have our, finger, we have our fingers in a whole lot of stuff. That suggests that the U.S. military is scattered uh, largely around the globe, whereas China has the, has the luxury of, of, of concentrating close to home. China can, have, China can hope to at least be relatively superior within the waters and skies that it cares about, which, which again would be the Western Pacific. So as we see, as we see uh, Moses coming down with the laws of strategy, yes, stay concentrated, but it's really not that easy to do. Think about, think about why that is. Let's delve into this just a little bit more. If, if I'm right, the United States has a hard time shedding commitments even when the need seems to be pressing. Why is that true? Well, I mean, you can think about it in terms of opportunity costs. What would the United States have to cut loose in order to concentrate more of its forces in the Western Pacific? Well, what would happen if we draw down in Europe? You're going to get, you're going to get major protests from our, from our NATO allies. What if, what if we draw down in, uh, say, the, the Caribbean Sea? You're going, to, you're, going to see, you're going to have trouble with our, with our Latin American friends. Every, every one of these commitments is going to have a constituency, and it's going, to make it, it's going to make it tough to actually concentrate forces in the Western Pacific to outmatch uh, China on its own turf. There's simple geographic distance. Another, another map out of the uh, Fortune Atlas from 1943, depicting basically just how hard it is and how far, how far away U.S. forces have to go just to get into battle theaters in Western Europe and, and, and East Asia, as we did in, 1940, in the 1940s. Look at that. You have to sweep around either side of Eurasia. You have to pass lots of congested territory that might be armed by your adversaries. It's just not, a, it's just not an easy thing to do to get from the east coast of the United States into the Indian Ocean, the west coast into the Pacific, whatever the case may be. It takes bases, doesn't it? This is an old photo of uh, Pearl Harbor from back in the 1980s. We, we, talked about, we talked about cost of budgetary differentials and so forth. Maintaining a facility like this to help your, your maritime forces get into the theaters, that's, a, that is something that's, uh, that's simply going to demand a lot out of your force structure and out of your budgetary, uh, uh, your budgetary resources. In fact, I like, I, like to go, I like to reach back to high school physics and talk about it in terms of the inverse squares law. I mean, think, think about when we radiate radiation from a particular source. This is the simple graphic measurement makes the point that the, the radiation intensity doesn't drop off in sort of a gradual linear fashion. It goes off the cliff as, as you get farther and farther from that uh, source. Military power is kind of like that. You really, it's really, really hard to boost the signal as you go along. You need bases, you need uh, logistical capability, you need all that kind of stuff that you need to operate hundreds or thousands of miles from your own shores. So again, just to recap, recap obeying that highest and simplest law of Clausewitz is really hard, far from your, far from your own coastlines. And this, this actually, uh, this, is, this doesn't even really start to get to, to the heart of the question. We'd like, to, we'd like to say in the strategy department that the enemy is not a potted plant. The enemy gets a vote in the success or failure of your strategy, and the enemy is going to want your strategy to fail. And that is, if you're going into his backyard, that means he's going to have a lot of options, even if he is weaker on the whole than you are. It's not really easy to be like the great Bruce Lee in Fist of Fury back in the 1970s, go into somebody else's dojo and punch him out, take out his entire force. That's, a, that's sort, of what, sort of the idea that we have to, to accomplish here. Why is, why is it so hard? More like, when you try to go into, onto the uh, other side's home, to home field or home turf, this is probably somebody, this is probably the metaphor you have to have in mind. This is a General uh, Paul Van Riper of the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, really inventive guy. Back in 2002, there was an exercise uh, called Millennium Challenge, in which Van Riper, he basically commanded Iranian forces facing off against the U.S. Uh, Navy uh, Carrier Task Force operating in the Persian Gulf region. He was basically given the same resources that Iran would have, which would be, would, would be a bunch of speedboats, some airplanes, and so forth, you know, pretty limited resources. And yet, he was wildly creative in defending the Persian Gulf. And he actually sank that carrier task force. I mean, he was doing wild stuff like using mosques to pass orders out to the fleet. I mean, they're just, just, just crazy stuff, except it worked. And so I, it, this is always the metaphor that comes to mind when I think about trying to carry the fight to somebody else in their own, in their own backyard. That's a, I mean, this is somebody who is wildly creative with limited resources and actually gets it done. By the way, what do you think the Navy does after, after he actually uh, brings this about? The Navy, 
yeah, the Navy changes the rules so that the Navy wins. He, he actually, Van Riper actually resigns. I don't think he brought legal action, but he actually, he actually quit in disgust after we changed the assumptions so that the Navy would prevail. Uh, don't, don't do that. I mean, that's, that's really a stupid thing to do when you're facing off against a savvy foe. Think about, think about some of the other, the other assets that go to the home team. I mean, here's, here's Texas A&M University, which uh, claims to be the inventor of the idea of the 12th man. The home team has lots of manpower right there close to scenes of action. They're not to, I don't think the fans are allowed to rush the field or otherwise assault the, the opposing team, but you get the, you get the idea. Lots of manpower, very close by. Bases, bases are close by. You have short routes to, to potential points of conflict. There's just a lot of, there's just a lot of geographic advantage and, and manpower advantages that go along with fighting off your own, own shorelines. You, you can have really vicious fans. These are, this is Duke University, where, they, where, the, where, the, where the basketball fans are crazy. They, in fact, they call them Cameron crazies. They are allowed to harass the opposing team and to try to miss uh, shots and so on and so forth. Again, kind of, a, kind of a metaphor for what you can see in military affairs as well. There's nobody in for, to enforce rules against this sort of thing, is there? In fact, you want to amass more resources, more manpower at the scene of conflict. Nobody's, nobody's going to compel a, a home team to maintain the same size team as the United States and its allies as visitors. In fact, if you had anybody try to referee, it would probably be ineffective like this referee off to the side as this poor guy gets tossed out of the ring. There is nobody to, to maintain fair play. In fact, this, is, this, this would be the metaphor, the sports metaphor I would reach for. This is a, the fans rushing the field after Manchester City won the English Premier League a few years ago. They're allowed to rush the field, and they're allowed to be soccer hooligans. These are all assets, these are all advantages that go to that home team in this sort of free-for-all environment that is combat. Bear in mind, yes, so again, the enemy gets a vote, and the enemy is going to cast that vote against the success of your strategy going, going into this faraway game. So to, to wrap this up and start to get us towards, uh, towards the Q&A, I would actually describe Mahan, our second president here, and of course, uh, one, probably the most influential sea power historian and theorist of all time. He actually, he actually acts as a zombie killer here. He reduces a lot of these ideas to a simple formula that we can use to try to estimate whether we are strong enough relative to our potential adversaries in the Indo-Pacific region. Let me, break, let me break it down really, really careful, carefully for you and give you something to, to take away with you. If I want to size a fleet so that, it, so that it can actually accomplish its goals, I need to do a couple of things. I need to estimate whether it is great enough. When he says great enough, he's talking about the, the, the material measures that we started off talking about at the beginning of the hour. How many hulls do I have? What combat power, what sensors, all of these material things have, a, have, a, uh, have I actually assigned to my fleet? Have I built the right fleet and sized it correctly? Okay, so there's the, mater there's the material factor there. I need, to, I, need to size that, I need to size that fleet relative to my adversary so that it can take to the, fleet, to the sea rather, and fight with reasonable chances of success reasonable chances of success. So there's an element of probability in there. I may not, I may not be able to act, absolutely overwhelm my adversary, but I need to figure out whether I'm giving myself a fair chance. Great Britain, back in, back in the age of sail, greatest navy in the world for, for, for a couple of centuries, used to, used to have what they called the two power standard. Basically, they would look at the, at the, at the, at the combined fleets of their next two, biggest, uh, next two biggest navies, assume that they would join forces, and that was how they sized the Royal Navy. Uh, so the, and basically, they said, well, if we have equal numbers, well, we're Great Britain, so we're going we're, we're gonna, to we're go in with equal numbers, and because of seamanship and gunnery and all this other stuff that we do better than anybody else, that was what they thought would give them the edge in combat, even with equal numbers of ships and, and guns and so on and so forth. So that's, a, that's the kind of uh, a probability assessment that uh, Mahan wants us to get into. Okay, so material factors, probability. And then he talks about measuring ourselves against the largest force that we are likely to meet. This is kind of an interesting one because it's, he's talking about politics here. I talked about opportunity costs and, and other political calculations a minute ago. If, I, if, I, if I'm facing off against another rival, I need to figure out what else that, what else that power is doing in the world. If I'm looking at China, what other, China, what other commitments does China have that I need, that I need to, to plan against? I, I need to figure out the largest fraction of my adversary's force that I am likely to meet at a potential battleground. 
Once I, do, once I do that, I've alleviated myself of the need to plan against this entire force. I just need to plan against the force that I will actually meet in battle. So again, political calculation, there's a political calculation trying to figure out what fraction of the adversary's force the political leadership of that adversary is likely to put into battle. And that becomes the, the, the benchmark, the measuring stick for, for what I need to put out there. So, so again, politics. Uh, the opportunity cost, the material, so the material thing, and just uh, simple probabilities. These are uh, this is a deceptively simple uh, passage that Mahan puts out there, but yet I reach for I reach for it quite a bit in my own writing, simply because it is a, it, there's really it's really rich in content. When you boil all this down, and then we're going to turn it over to Q and A. I think this is the question that we are, that we're actually considering as we go out zombie killing. What what happens when a fraction of the United States Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard Goes up against the entirety of an adversary force, close to that, close to that, uh, close to that adversary's own shores, backed up by its air force, its strategic rocket force, and potentially even its army. That's really what we're talking about. The, the, United, the United States having part of its force going out into the Pacific Ocean to, con con to confront potentially the entirety of the PLA, but perhaps by, even backed by the Russian military as well. And that's, a, that's really a difficult, that's really a lot more difficult calculation than these simple ideas about spending and uh, tonnage and those so, so forth would actually convey to you. Who, who is going to win? And that's sort of where, that's sort of where we are as we debate strategy and force design and try, trying to execute the, the military strategy that our current administration has uh, before us, and which is actually an extension more or less of what the previous administration bequeathed to us as well. Here's what I would leave with you. When you when you hear these when you hear these ideas from if, even from eminent scholars such as the ones I've uh, pictured here, just ask the tough questions and let the buyer beware. From there, I will. T so what I, I've thrown a lot of material at you. Questions. What, what what's on your mind? What what can we talk about some more as we consider all this stuff? I will assist you with the microphone so everyone can hear your, your questions, please. Which will be the first question, yeah, for don't be Professor shy. Holmes? Don't be shy. I've got a question. Tony, yeah, the host always the host always has one in his back pocket, just in case. Based on everything you've just discussed, based on all the factors you just discussed, do you think the U.S. Navy is on the right track in the way we're pursuing our construction plans and all that? Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's sort of where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? And I, I think the, the answer is, I, my gut feel is yes. I think I actually feel a lot better than I, than I did even a couple of uh, years ago about our prospects. And the reason, I, the reason for that is this. For, for one thing, I think we've just gotten serious. The, uh, we, did a really, uh, we did a really foolish thing right after the Cold War, and this is one of my other hobby horses that I'm going to climb up onto since, since you've given me the, uh, the ability to do it. And I was, I was actually here t uh, teaching it down at the Surface Warfare School, right to about 100 yards from here back then. In 1992, the, the Navy issued its first post-Cold War effort at strategy. And it, basically, and it basically said, the Soviet Union is no more, the Soviet Navy is no more, there's nobody else to fight for command of the sea, for all the kind of stuff we've been talking about here for the last 45 minutes. And therefore, we should remake ourselves as a fundamentally different naval service. That's a, that's a direct quotation. We can, we can afford not to prepare to fight for command of the sea because there's nobody left to fight. That's a, I mean, too, it's, strangely enough, this was actually the same year that Frank Fukuyama put out his, his famous thesis about the end of history, almost exactly the same time. In fact, he, his idea was basically that all forms of government have been tested out now. Liberal democracy is best and therefore history has ended. The Navy is basically saying that naval history has ended and that our first and foremost function is no longer viable. We can simply assume that we can use the sea for whatever we want to because we're the biggest, the strongest, and there will be nobody to contest our access. The way I've been, uh, the way I've been uh, explaining that somebody now can contest that, ac that access. If you think about that, I mean, let's say, if, if, for somebody in uniform, for your, for your big boss, Chief of Naval Operations, Commandant of the Marine Corps, Commandant of the Coast Guard, to say something like that, that you no longer need to prepare for, to fight for command, that's a really, really powerful bureaucratic signal. You know what? The service has actually complied with that. We stopped preparing to fight other submarines. We stopped, we stopped upgrading our anti-ship missile capability. We stopped doing a whole lot of stuff and basically built, built in an intellectual lag, I think, that we're only now starting to get over. 
So, which is one reason I think you've seen the Navy, the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard sort of flailing around because it's one thing to get serious about it, but it's another thing to get a big institution to start coming along and doing the things it needs to do. So, but I think I actually think we're we, we're getting religion about the, about the need to compete against China and Russia, Iran potentially, whoever the case may be. And gradually, the material capabilities are starting to follow as well. We're getting good. We're starting to get good at unmanned systems, which I think is going to be key to the to the size of the future fleet. Uh, we've gotten serious about anti-ship and aircraft missiles and so forth, and a lot of that stuff is starting to come come to fruition now. So we're starting to have the material capability in line and uh, offset some of that stuff that, uh, that I said we're, we're in trouble on. Uh, Jim, yeah, why did uh, Jim Mattis consider you troublesome? Oh, uh, he, uh, we, and this is, a, you're actually sending me off on another tangent. Captain Jay was actually my last boss in, in uniform, by the way, back, back in 1996, believe it or not. We, uh, we I, got to, I got to know him because we, we, we were sort of, our minds were sort of working on, on uh, parallel tracks. We were thinking about how to make things really difficult on China. I mean, I put an article, a couple articles in the Naval Institute proceedings about how to make things really tough for China. And the, the idea was basically, and I, did, I didn't get into this, but the idea was basically if the first island chain, the, the, the island chain from Japan down through Taiwan, down through the Philippine Islands, and on around through the Indonesian archipelago, those are American friends or allies or, or both. If you, if you want to make things really tough on China, you can, actually, you can actually threaten to close the straits between all of those islands and basically pin up China in its own backyard. Yeah, and you can do that on the cheap, I think. You, I mean, you can, you, it's, it's not hard to t put a diesel submarine out there to, to lay a minefield or whatever the case may be. To do, and if you pose that threat to China, if you pose to, to sever China's contact with the outside world commercially and militarily, that's a really powerful way to, to, to deter China. So he and I had been, it turned out he had been thinking along the same line, so he dropped me a line and we started, and he said, Dan, you're really, you're really troublesome to your, to your superiors. And, he, and I asked him if, he could put, if I could put that in my bio, and he said, yes, as long as you make clear that it is a compliment and not a criticism. <laughs> so, yeah, he's a, but yeah, that's a, and I think we've actually seen that strategy start to take shape as well when you look at what we, are at, we and our Japanese friends and so forth have started to do along the island chain. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't think I have as clear. I'm some, actually, possibly some other people here have a clearer sense on this. But I, I mean, if, in the terms that I put it to you, I would say that that's, that's actually going to that's actually going to exacerbate that budgetary that budgetary differential that we talked about. Simply by simply by cutting the costs to China or to Russia or whoever of. Uh, developing t technologies that are more or less uh, parallel to our own, I think, and so again, I, I, I don't do classified work, so I don't have a really strong, a really strong uh, fix on this. But it, it does seem like it does seem like China has come a long way in a short time. They, I mean, they claim to have leaped to, to a staged a, a technological leap to parity with the United States Navy. I mean, for, they, they'll always tell you that their uh, destroyers that they're developing now are peers of our own. I, I mean, I, I think there's a certain amount of guesswork there. I, my guess is they're probably a generation behind, but they've come a long way in a short period of time, and that, that must be part of it, which is part of, probably, part of, probably why some of their stuff looks a lot like our stuff, just like Soviet stuff looked a lot like our stuff during the Cold War. I think there's, I think there was, there's something to that as well. But yeah, that's a, that's a cost-cutting measure for our adversaries if they can steal technology and ideas. Oh, sir, please. Sir, great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, regarding your formula of the Navy against the PLA's entire assets, its Army, Air Force, et cetera, um, shouldn't we also include that in our own calculation, not only our other armed services, but our, you alluded to our allies and partners in the region as well? Thank you. Absolutely. No, it's a, and I think the, the, the more we can leverage, the more we can leverage Non, uh, not strictly naval assets, as well as allies and so forth, the, the better off we are. One thing, one thing that's, and, and actually do it back to Tony's question, one other thing that I've found really gratifying in recent years is as we start thinking about, uh, thinking about uh, bulking up American sea power in the Far East and, and the Indian Ocean is just how, just how eagerly the, the United States Army and the United States Air Force have embraced their role as maritime services. I mean, you're starting to you're seeing the Air, the Air Force send out bombers to do things like uh, drop precision minefields at sea. 
again, if you want to, if you want to make things tough on the PLA Navy, there's, there's the Air Force playing a role. If you, if you think about when I talked about uh, closing those straits along the island chain to Chinese, to Chinese access, a lot of the, the implements you would probably use for that would be things like uh, bodies of ground troops armed with anti-ship missiles that would basically be on those islands and could, and could actually reach out and touch ships, trying, ships and airplanes trying to go through those straits. That's an army function. The, the, army, the, the Army has actually has actually deliberately tried to rediscover its own past as a maritime service. Keep in, keep in mind, if you look at uh, World War II in the Pacific, the, the, the uh, army, army people will tell you that they, they actually did more amphibious stuff than the United States Marines. Uh, General MacArthur, of course, uh, commanded the, one of the major legs of the expedition towards the Philippine Islands where he had promised to return. Again, I mean, there's, so, you had, so the, the, in a sense, the Army is getting back to its own roots as a sea service, and the Air Force seems to be joining it as well. So yeah, all the, by all means, uh, if, if the problem was joint, I think the, I think the uh, solution is probably joint as well. Absolutely. That's, that's pretty good. You were saying that um, part of your cal calculations and part of the fallacies is how much you spend and how expensive away war games are. Recently, with the whole Korea scare, and I call it scare because I was close to it, um, they were demanding and they were asking to stop the war games, and there were some that were canceled or postponed. Do you think that the enemy would see that as a weakness? Do you think that stopping those war games um, has a negative effect on the U.S. and the armies and navies and forces? Well, I, I work at the Naval War College, so I have to say yes. <laughs> well, now, I mean, we're, we're, we're basically right below where, we're right below where the game floor almost, uh, where, where war, plan, war Plan Orange was assembled here in the 1920s and 1930s. I mean, that, that was basically the, the, Navy, the Navy's effort to foresee how Japan might wage war against us and our ability, or in our effort to, to figure out how we ought to do things to counter that. Yeah, I mean, gaming, I mean, gaming is a huge thing. You, you, if, President Trump's idea seems to be that you can postpone it for a while to try to ease tensions, and I think that, I think that's possibly true for a while. But ultimately, ultimately, if we do not practice where we are going to play, I mean, back to the sports analogy, you need to practice where you're going to play. Ultimately, if we if we do not practice uh, what we might need to do again in a North Korean situation, well. We, we would be fighting alongside allies there. You need to practice with your allies. I mean, there's, you, you simply have to stay competent or else your efforts to deter the North are simply gonna lose credibility. If Kim Jong-un stops believing in our capability to do what we say we're gonna do, at that point, deterrence is really gonna start to sag and it's become, gonna become a major problem. So, so yeah, I, so I, as a temporary expedient, maybe, but as a long-term uh, solution, I, I think it would be a, a bad move. See, I'm not speaking for the government. <laughs> I used to work at the University of Georgia, and when I would come to a forum like here, like this, where I was operating with the U.S. government people, I would always say, "I am speaking for the state of Georgia." So, complain to the governor if you don't if you don't like it. <laughs> uh, sir, what a role do you see the Coast Guard uh, filling in uh, this Pacific strategy? I think the I think the. Uh, I've, I've kind of lost. I've kind of lost touch with the with the budgetary situ situation with the Coast Guard. But I know the Trump administration came in talking about cutting the Coast Guard's budget. And I was like, man, that is, I think that would be the worst thing. To, the worst thing. I would almost let, rather have a Coast Guard that's twice or uh, three times its current size as a bigger Navy. Al almost. I mean, I've, the, the, we are in a naval place. But I mean, think about think about what the Coast Guard gives you. If you read the if you read the Coast Guard's uh, website, they will remind you that the Coast Guard is indeed a fifth a, a fifth combat service. It's been a while since they've done combat things as far as uh, you know strict Navy type stuff. But as late as the Vietnam War, you had a you had a Coast Guard cruiser that was actually doing gunfire support against against uh, the Vietnamese coast. So, I mean, there is the, there is that legacy there. But I think that I think the Coast Guard's uh, real contribution would be in places like the South China Sea, where China is contesting basically the sovereignty of coastal states such as the Philippine Islands, Vietnam, uh, our other friends, uh, fr friends and allies in the region. These are basically legal questions. If, if China, and that's one reason I, uh, I splashed that picture of the China Coast Guard and the Chinese fishing fleet uh, on the screen up there. That, these are the major implements that China can use to try to degrade their sovereignty and try to, try to establish the principle that China rules in, the, in those waters which don't belong to it at all under international law. That's, that's why we had a huge uh, international law case a couple of years ago in which China got a major slap down, but also refused to, to accept the results. I mean, these, these are Coast Guard type, these are law enforcement type, type uh, problems. 
if you think about what the Coast Guard could do, I mean, I, 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 could, see, I could see doing things like uh, getting with the Filipinos and basically forming a combined Coast Guard between ourselves and the Philippine Coast Guard. At, at that point, the United States would start showing that it has skin in the game of this uh, contest for sovereignty and for freedom of the sea. If it, the more that we show that we're all into the problem, I think the more seriously our allies will take us, and the more and the more the more deterrent uh, the deterrent power it would have vis-a-vis -vis Beijing or Russia in the Sea of Azov in the in the Black Sea or whatever the case may be. So yeah, I think that we, the, there's a major missed opportunity to to get a lot of uh, uh, geopolitical value out of the Coast Guard. So yeah, that's. Uh, I think I, I think I agree with the drift of where you were going. That's, yeah, we're, we need to d rediscover that resource. I've stunned you all into silence. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, the MSDF. Uh, thank you for your the MSDF requires him to requires him to ask a question. Yes, sir. I think you suppose that if United States has enough power, you know, enough, sorry, enough power, the United States Navy can win the enemy. But if the war is limited, the resource or risk depends on the value of the objective. The value of the South China Sea is barely, uh, it's higher for China side. Yep. And that of the United States is much less than that of China. So I think it is possible, even if the United States have much naval power than that of China, if the value of object, object is much less than that of China, the United States cannot put enough naval resources to the ocean and eventually lose the war. What do you think about the difference of value of objective? Yeah, I didn't want to I didn't want to go too far into Clausewitz with you all, but I mean that's 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 basically the best we know that uh, Mahan Mahan never read Clausewitz as far as we know, but a lot of the things he says sound a lot like Clausewitz. If you think of it, oh, where's my uh, where's my uh, clicker? We'll go back to that uh, go back to that uh, passage that I closed with. That I mean it's uh, that's what that's what Mahan he, Mahan is actually alluding to it. Keep going. There we go. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's part of the likelihood. I mean, when he talks about the, the the biggest force I am likely to meet at a potential scene of battle, part of that part of that depends on how much my adversary wants its goals. And you're 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 basically saying that China cares a whole lot about what happens in the South China Sea. I mean, in fact, in fact, in fact if you if you read what uh, Xi Jinping, the president of China, and his and his lieutenants and his predecessors Hu Jintao and so forth have to say about that, they have repeatedly stated that this is part of China's uh, effort to come back from a century of humiliation, reaching all the way back to the 1830s at the hands of Western seaborne conquerors. I mean, this was the imperial. This is something that it really, really resonates not only with the Chinese leadership, but also with the rank and file Chinese citizens. Man, I tell you, I tell you what, you're, you're, really, you're really framing a powerful appeal to, appeal to those constituencies there. And you, he's basically, uh, President Xi and his, and his advisors have basically bound themselves to, uh, to basically do whatever it takes in order to restore Chinese sovereignty. I mean, they, they, they talk about historic claims to most, of, most or all of the South China Sea dating back hundreds or thousands of years. I mean, these are things that suggest that China is really all in on its claims on the South China Sea. So that, uh, that and this would be something that would support what I said about China's, uh, China's luxury of concentrating most or, of all, or all of its assets in the waters that it cares a lot about, which would be South China Sea around the Senkaku Islands and the East China Sea, whatever the case may be. The calculation would be that the United States, if you turn, into the, turn this around and point it at the United States from the Chinese standpoint, the calculation on, on, on China's part would be that the United States is not likely to put most or all of its uh, assets into a contest uh, to basically preserve freedom of the sea. And that, yeah, that's, and that, that, makes, that makes this actually look doable from a Chinese standpoint, simply because China wants it a whole lot and the United States does not necessarily because it has other things going in the world. And plus, how do you, how do you explain that to the American people that you want to send their sons and their daughters and all this, all this expensive equipment over to defend something that looks kind of abstract? I mean, think about it. I mean, even people here at the War College will sometimes think, say things like, uh, are we really going to fight with China over a bunch of rocks? 
Well, I mean, I mean that's I mean that's kind of what the the, the manufactured islands on the South China, the Senkaku Islands are uninhabited. I mean, that's that's actually that's actually a, a pretty powerful thing to say, even though I think it's it's utterly misguided. We're actually talking about the nature of the international system, whether it's sovereignty, whether it's uh, freedom of the sea, all of these things. Go to go to the nature of to, of the system over which we have presided since 1945, and without which the modern the modern world really would not work the, on a commercial or a military level. Trying to put that, trying to explain that to your average person on the street is not not the easiest thing in the world to do. So that's that's kind of where we are as we as we try to make the case to actually execute a, a decent strategy that upholds freedom of the sea in the Far East. And uh, I'm not sure I have any uh, any pat answers for you, but you're you're entirely right to look at political motivations and basically how much we want it relative to our adversaries. You guys want it a lot. You live in the region, though. Okay, well, I tell you what, I will hang out for a few minutes if anybody wants to talk offline. But uh, other than that, thank you, for your, thank you for your kind attention and for coming out this evening. And uh, we shall, oh, I think I was supposed to give a teaser for the, for the next, uh, for the next uh, round, of, round of lectures as well. Oh, oh, Dean's doing it. Oh, well, you'll, get, you'll, hear, by, you'll hear by email. There is supposed to be a slide up on the screen right now that looks much ah, like there we go, this. There we go. Not yet. Yeah, yeah much, that's, better, that's better. Yeah, I like that one better. I'm the one with ah, questions there we go, right there we now. Go. Okay, so the next lecture we'll have is civil military relations. That is going to be on February 19th. So I hope we'll see you all there. Uh, if you have any questions about this, please feel free. Contact us between now and then. Thank you for your, uh, uh, your attention. If you didn't get a chance to sign in uh, on the sheet out by the uh, vessel fuel there, please do so on your way out. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you next